Hello and welcome to Charity Chat, the ACNC's podcast. In this episode, we'll have a look at the question of the number of charities in Australia and discuss some of the details and features of the Australian charity sector. My name is Matt Crichton and I work in the education team here at the ACNC. And joining me to look at this question of how many charities there are in Australia is the Commissioner of the Australian Charities Not For Profits Commission, Susan Pascoe. Hello, Susan. Hello, Matt. Whether or not there are too many charities in Australia is a question that elicits a range of perspectives, um, both from within the sector itself and the public more broadly. But just first things first, how many charities are there registered in Australia? There are 54,500 registered charities in Australia. And that figure is not static, is it? It does go up and down as, as organisations open and close. It does. Uh, and in fact, the ACNC uh, keeps a live ticker, if you like, on the website. <laughs> right. uh, so you can get on one day and see that there maybe there's um, 5,620, and then the next day there might be 5,625. In the meantime, what may well have happened is um, 10 charities be registered uh, and five voluntarily um, revoke their own registration status right. because they've completed their, their mission. Okay. So there's very much a, a sense uh, that it's uh, an organic um, exercise. It's, I think it's very important to note that along with the other common law countries, that there's a almost a stasis in the number of charities that pretty much along with England and Wales, Scotland, um, Ireland and uh, Canada, the US, New Zealand, what we find is that roughly every year the same number as we officially register voluntarily deregister. And of course for all of the regulators there's a small number that uh, are involuntarily uh, deregistered and that's because of malpractice. And that, that number, even though it does, sort of sits at a plateau at 54,000. Some people might still say that that's quite a large number for a country like Australia to have 54,000 charities. And, and it sounds large, doesn't it? Look, it does. The um, interesting thing for me is that pretty much every time I do media, and indeed no matter the topic, uh, eventually the interviewer will come around to the number of charities in Australia and almost inevitably will put the assertion that there are too many. Now, that's not a view I share. Uh, for me, if you look at the size of this country, if you look at the spread of the community across Australia, particularly think of far north Queensland, the Northern Territory, far north Western Australia, um, and other regional um, and more remote parts of the country, when you look at the spread of charities, they are pretty much spread right across those communities. And if you put your mind to a stroll down any um, high street of any of the towns that you go into, you'll probably find a few churches, uh, all of which will be charities. You may well find a non-government school, uh, generally religious, um, often Catholic school. Uh, you're probably going to find a country women's association. You might find an RSL. You might find a legacy club. You might find an emergency service. You might find, if it's a coastal community of surf life saving, I could go on. Uh, each of these communities has these charities within them. And I think that there's a powerful argument to say that the grassroots nature of civil society is such that those communities quite legitimately have their own charities. They don't want to be managed from the, the large uh, regional town nearby. They, they want to be able to set up and organise for themselves. I'd like to add, though, that there's a caveat here, and that is that if um, there is a duplication in effort in any of the communities, large or small, that we're talking about, then there really is an onus on the charities to try and collaborate and not to um, dilute the impact that donations could have by replicating each other's services. So that is the, the strong caveat, I think. Right, right. And it's an important point you make, though, because also that can be mutually beneficial in that there's a cooperation or a sharing of resources that organisations can 
um, benefit from if they were to undertake such a such yeah, an enterprise. Absolutely. And indeed, I might add, Matt, that uh, when you look at the annual governance survey that's conducted by the Australian Institute of Company Directors into the not-for-profit sector, they find quite high levels of sharing of back office services and of discussions of collaboration and, in fact, practice of collaboration, which includes practices such as referrals from one to another, um, sharing, uh, it might be advocacy, sharing personnel from time to time if they both can't afford uh, to have a right. fully uh, yep. funded staff member. Um, and it gets down to the level of cooperation that eventually might become a merger. Right, um, okay. But so the, the, along a continuum of collaborative activities, there's really a high level of uh, engagement happening in the not-for-profit sector. And just getting back to that number of 54,000 and the types of organisations included, some of which you described before, I think that's a really important point because although people that have listened to this podcast previously may be aware, others are unlikely to be aware that many of the organisations they don't ordinarily think of as charities are in fact registered charities and they of course contribute to this figure of 54,000 and a half. Uh, they do. 54 and a half thousand. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> they do. Uh, and uh, there are, I think, uh, reasons for some of the confusion. One is that the original conception of charity dates back to the statute of Elizabeth I in 1601, when in fact there were really what were called four heads of charity, uh, religion, education, um, welfare, uh, and activities in the public benefit were deemed to be charitable and other activities not. But over um, the, the intervening um, four centuries, common law has developed and now there is an understanding that there's a much broader range of activities that could be deemed charitable and indeed in the Australian Charities Act which sought to codify the common law um, and modernise as well from that uh, you know four century old statute uh, we now have activities such as human rights, um, environmental advocacy, reconciliation included in uh, charitable activities and, and in my view very legitimately intruded in, in charitable activities. Which of course will add to the, the, the greater number there, if, particularly right. if people don't think of those organisations as charities, it may seem like the number is greater yeah. than, than they think it should be. And um, you mentioned before that, that there is recognition that there may be charities um, that, that undertake similar purposes or similar activities and they can benefit from um, cooperation or collaboration. Do you think that's a, a common occurrence across um, the charity sector? Are there too many doing the same thing? I think there are particular areas such as um, some of the medical research areas. It's not uncommon uh, when a family loses a loved one to a rare disease or many disease really um, that they might want to contribute to research to combat that disease. Right, yeah. Um, and very often their first impulse is to create a new charity, yep. particularly with the name of the, the loved one who's been lost. Now what we try and do is encourage them if we know that there's an existing medical research body that is doing work in that area to become even a named designated fund within that right, existing right. Uh, medical research body. Uh, look, we're not always successful because very often um, in the, the trauma of the loss, uh, people feel very strongly that this is how they want to express their grief. Um, and as the regulator, we implement the law as it is. We have no right really to stand in the way of a charity that meets all of the criteria for registration. So uh, there are occasions where we would also take the view that you could consolidate, but I think what we do when we've tried our best to, to make that happen and it hasn't worked is then encourage at least collaboration in the endeavour and in, particularly in the case of medical research there are high levels of collaboration anyway. And this is just um, a sort of step on the way to efficiency in a way isn't it? it it's, is, it's not yeah. to discourage anyone from following their dreams or anything like that? It, no, it's, just... it's, it's not but perhaps <clears throat> to recommend to people that they, they may in fact get better bang for their buck if they uh, choose to be a fund within an existing charity rather than create a new one of their own. And there's a lot of work in setting up a new charity too. I think. And a lot might... of, really, there is annual 
compliance obligations yeah, right. that need to be met. Uh, and in fact, all of that could be handled by an existing enterprise. So you need to think carefully whether that's the path you want to take. With the charity sector now covering so many purposes, you mentioned, well, well I say so many, there is the, the Charities Act um, lists uh, 12 charitable purposes. That brings about greater diversity in, in the charity sector. What are some of the benefits of having a sector that is so diverse? Look, I think it's a good thing for civil society when you've got people with a broad range of interests who are seeking to um, speak out on those interests or to actively contribute to those interests. It could be someone who's passionate about the arts and they want to either fundraise for the arts or get involved in the arts in, in a particular way. It could be someone who's greatly distressed by levels of homelessness and wants to contribute to, in a, in a very direct way, you know, maybe taking food to the homeless personally or getting involved in one of the charities that has mobile services to support the homeless. So there are ways that either directly through direct action or indirectly through fundraising or donating that people can contribute to causes that ignite their, their interests and their passions. And I think that's a very healthy thing for any community. And just getting back to this number again, so you mentioned your view is not that there are, there are too many charities in Australia. What is the significance of the number, do you think? 54,500 54 charities sounds like a lot, as I mentioned. Do you think that the sheer size of Australia means that there's a need for such a large number of organisations? Well, I think sometimes comparisons are helpful. And when you look at the number of charities per head of population in Australia, we actually have the lowest number of any of the... Uh, English-speaking countries. Right. Uh, and so that was helpful to us when we were trying to determine whether this um, view that there are too many charities um, is a substantial view. Uh, so I think that's worth keeping in mind. In addition, as I mentioned earlier, when you think of the sheer size of the Australian landmass and the fact that the charities are spread right across it, it's not surprising really. Now, whether you can um, get greater efficiencies in those charities um, is something that needs continual vigilance. And because donors are giving um, from their own pockets. Because the Australian taxpayer is subsidising the work of charities through tax concessions, I think it's legitimate for the, for the, the community, the broader community, to have an interest in the conduct of charities. Uh, but I suppose the message would be, take a good look at what they're doing. Are they meeting a need? Um, if they are, the people involved in that charity, then the, it's likely to be worthwhile to support the cause. Okay, well that's just about all the time we have for today's episode. Thank you very much for your time, Susan. I think it's been a really fascinating discussion because it's a fascinating question and it raises um, some very strong opinions within and without the charity sector yes. whenever it's raised. Yeah. Thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Be sure to check out other episodes of ACNC Charity Chat and other resources including guides, fact sheets and webinars on our website at acnc.gov.au. And if you enjoyed this podcast and would like to hear more, subscribe on iTunes or wherever you happen to access it. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.